multi-segment transmission line devices. In this video, we're going to talk about the very famous and well-known quarter wave transformer. That leads into impedance matching, and then we'll end this with two very quick introductory discussions of stubs and scattering parameters. We are definitely not doing a sufficient job covering stubs and scattering parameters here. That's really meant for a microwave engineering class, but I at least want to mention it so that you can see that. Quarter wave transformer. Let's ask ourselves what happens when a signal travels through a section of transmission line that is a quarter wavelength long. When it's a quarter wavelength long, let's look at this product of beta times L. Beta, the phase constant, is 2 pi over the wavelength, and this is the wavelength in the transmission line, not the free space wavelength. The length of the transmission line we gave as a quarter wavelength, again the wavelength in the transmission line, when we multiply these together, the lambdas cancel, this 2 cancels with the 4 to leave a 2 in the denominator, we end up with a pi over 2. What that means is when a signal travels through a quarter wavelength section of transmission line, it accumulates exactly 90 degrees of phase. Let's think about what the implication of this is. Let's look at our impedance transformation equation and we'll plug in lambda over 4, so that means this beta L becomes pi over 2. Same equation now, but we have tangent of pi over 2. Well, it turns out the tangent of pi over 2 is infinity. And so what do we do with this? In order to get an expression, we have to apply something called L'Hopital's rule. And if we have the limit of two things where each of these are infinity, what we can do is look at the rate at which they approach infinity, which means we'll look at the ratio of their first order derivatives. So that's how we can solve this. Apply L'Hopital rule to our impedance transformation equation. So there's our impedance transformation equation before we put in a quarter wavelength. And we apply L'Hopital's rule to that because we're doing this in the limit as beta L goes to pi over two. And we end up here. And in fact, these secant squareds cancel and the J's cancel and these two Z naughts we can multiply together. And what we see is that after a quarter wavelength, our input impedance becomes Z naught squared over L. So our input impedance at the load was L. Now it's Z naught over squared over L. So our impedance has essentially inverted. So in summary, that's what happens through a quarter wave section of transmission line. It's a very interesting thing. Let's look at some cases of quarter wave lines and what happens. Let's say we have some section of transmission line and it is a quarter wave long and it's driving an inductor right now. Well, to the generator, driving an inductor through a quarter wave line, that looks like a capacitor. How can we say that so quickly? Well, remember the input impedance is the characteristic impedance divided by the load impedance. So if we reciprocate the impedance of an inductor, that becomes the impedance of a capacitor. And the capacitance that the generator thinks it's driving is L over Z naught. So inductors look like capacitors when driven through a quarter wavelength section of transmission line. What if we're driving a capacitor through the same quarter wavelength of transmission line? Well, perhaps no surprise, it looks like an inductor. Again, because we're reciprocating the impedance. And so the effect of inductance is C times Z naught squared. Now let's think about what happens when we drive a short circuit through a quarter wavelength section of transmission line. The impedance of a short circuit is zero, so Z naught squared divided by zero is infinite, and it looks like we're driving an open circuit. So we can make short circuits look like open circuits simply by looking at them a quarter wavelength away. What if we drive an open circuit through a quarter wave section of transmission line? Well, the impedance of an open circuit is infinity, and the reciprocal, that one divided by infinity, gives us zero. 
So it looks like we're driving a short circuit. Open circuits look like short circuits when they're driven a quarter wavelength away. So inductors become capacitors, capacitors become inductors, short circuits become open circuits, open circuits become short circuits. Things are crazy. And this gives us a very neat design tool for designing microwave circuits. What if we have a matched load and we're driving that a quarter wavelength away? So a matched load means the load impedance equals the characteristic impedance. Well, the reciprocal of that, Z0 squared over Z0 is still just Z0. So in fact, as long as we're matched, the input impedance looks the same actually regardless of the length of the line. It could be quarter wave, three quarters wave, an eighth of a wave, 0.792 of a wave. It will always look like we're driving Z0 or ZL to the generator. So match lines are ideal. And in fact, this is a telltale sign that something's wrong with your system. If you're changing your cable lengths, you're moving your cable around or cutting it or something and things are changing, then there's a mismatch. If everything's right in your system, you should be able to swap out cables, move your cable around, and nothing fluctuates in the system if you're matched. Now let's talk about impedance matching. The analog of this is anti-reflection layers that we talked about when we were covering plane waves. So let's say we have a stretch of transmission line that we know is mismatched to this load. We would like to inject a quarter wave segment of transmission line so that we can match exactly to the load and prevent reflections. So if our input line is Z0, that means we want our input impedance looking forward to be Z0. So how do we do this? Well, first, we need to know what impedance this quarter wave section of line should be. Let's call that Z sub AR for anti-reflection. And again, this should be no surprise. It's the geometric mean. It's the square root of the product of the impedances on either side of this quarter wave transformer. Then we ask ourselves, what is the propagation constant in this line? And so really, that needs to come from an electromagnetic analysis. So the way this would typically go is we could calculate the impedance from the geometric mean. At that point, we would go to our electromagnetic simulation and we would adjust the properties of the transmission line until we get that impedance. Once we have that simulation, we could also get the phase constant from that simulation. So that phase constant comes from the simulation when we adjust our impedance. But once we have that phase constant, now we can calculate the physical length that that section of transmission line has to be to be a quarter wavelength. So we want length to be lambda over four, that's pi over two times the phase constant, the of the adjusted anti-reflection layer transmission line. So this L would be the physical length of our line. And if we do that, then we can match reflection exactly at that wavelength. As we drift away from that wavelength, that match begins to degrade. Let's work an example. Let's say we're driving a patch antenna on an FR4 substrate. So the dielectric constant is 4.4. It's a Wi-Fi antenna operating at 2.4 gigahertz. And the patch antenna has a 120 ohm input impedance. So in this case, the antenna is acting like the load on our transmission line. This circle region is the antenna. And this straight microstrip leading in, that's our transmission line leading in. So the antenna has a 120 ohm impedance. The transmission line here has a 50 ohm impedance. So there's a mismatch right here. So the question is, how much power is reflected and then we want to ask how the circuit can be improved to prevent reflections. So in terms of how much power is reflected, we go to our equation for the reflection coefficient. We're asking about power reflected, so it's magnitude squared. And so we plug in our numbers for the impedances. Our load impedance is the antenna input impedance. And the characteristic impedance for the microstrip transmission line was given to be 50 ohms. And we run the numbers here. We end up with 0.4 squared, or 17% of our power is reflected. That's probably pretty bad. We would like to fix that. What can we do to fix it? 
Well, we just talked about quarter wave transformers. What if we injected a quarter wave transformer here that would match a 50 ohm line to our 120 ohm input impedance antenna? Let's do that. So there is our basic design. What should the impedance be of this anti-reflection quarter wave transformer? Well, it's the geometric mean square root of the load impedance times the characteristic impedance. We plug in our numbers and we get 77.5 ohms. So this impedance is higher than this impedance. Impedance square root of L over C in order to make impedance go up we need to make the capacitance, the distributed capacitance, go down. And so we're making the transmission line thinner to make the distributed capacitance go down. Now, at this point, we should perform an electromagnetic analysis with the new width of the line to get the phase constant. However, if we're thinking about this as a waveguide and that's the TEM mode, the phase constant is very close to omega times the square root of mu epsilon, where this is the permeability and permittivity of the dielectric around the transmission line. Now here, since this is a microstrip, it's not a very great approximation because part of the field is in air, part is in the dielectric, but in the absence of having an electromagnetic simulation, let's go with this. So we'll replace the angular frequency with the ordinary frequency. We'll also pull out the mu naught epsilon naught as the speed of light. We'll plug in our numbers and our phase constant ends up being about 105.44. That's just an estimate. Really, that should come from an electromagnetic analysis. So the question is, what is the length? Well, it needs to be quarter wave. We need 90 degree phase through that stretch of line to be an anti-reflection layer transmission line. So that means our beta L, where here's our phase constant of that line that we just injected, needs to be pi over two or 90 degrees. So we can solve that equation for the physical length of that stretch of line. This is L. Now we can plug in our numbers and we plug in our value of beta that should have come from an electromagnetic simulation, but we're using that. We calculate it, we end up with 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2. In other words, the length of that line should be about 1.5 centimeters. And in fact, if we inject that line at 2.4 gigahertz, we'll get complete power transfer from the input line, which is 50 ohms, into our antenna, which is 120 ohms. And this kind of thing is done all the time in microwave circuits. And sometimes we'll use things a little bit fancier that give a broader band impedance matching but it's all about getting as much power to the load as possible. We're in a position now to understand stubs, and this is a topic that I'm just only going to touch on the surface of just to give you a feel for what they are. Uh, really, this is, this is handled in a microwave engineering class. So let's say we have a transmission line, but somewhere in the middle of that, there's a section of transmission line sticking off of that and short circuited at the end. And the length of this line sticking out is a quarter wavelength. What on earth happens here? Well, let's think about this. What do short circuits look like a quarter wavelength away? They look like an open circuit, right? So in fact, as long as we're injecting a signal with wavelength lambda, this acts like an open circuit right here and nothing happens, that signal passes. Everything else, it's not quite acting like an open circuit and it will tend to block the signal. So in a way we've made a bandpass filter out of this stub. So it acts like an open circuit. Now to any wavelength that it's not its design wavelength, it acts like a short circuit or at least something that would tend to block the signal. And our signal reflects when we excite it with something not the design wavelength. When we excite it with the design wavelength, it's not short circuited, the signal's not blocked, and that signal passes. So we have created a bandpass filter with this quarter wave stub. That's all I can really get into.
but stubs are used for filtering, impedance matching, many other things. But this concept of quarter wave length sections turning open circuits into short circuits is what's used for is what's used behind this mechanism. Here's just some pictures of some common stub, stubs from literature. These are called radial stubs. They act just like regular stubs, but they're a bit more broadband. Down here we have transmission lines, and what we can see is a transmission line it becomes wider than thinner. This is called actually a stepped impedance. So we have essentially a multi-layer, almost a brag grading kind of thing. But here are some stubs coming off of this. We can have stubs not with transmission lines, but with waveguides, and it acts by the same mechanism. And we can be almost guaranteed that this length is a quarter wavelength. So stubs are used a lot in practice particularly these radial stubs. You'll see all the time if you pick up a microwave circuit. On to our last topic, scattering parameters. This is another huge topic that I can only just barely touch on just to show you what's there. Scattering parameters comes from network theory. And essentially, we're forming a big matrix. And in a column vector, we're describing the amplitudes of all of our input signals. And we have n number of input signals. So we have n ports into this system. So we have some kind of weird electrical circuit here. And we have n number of ports coming into this thing. And so each one, the input signal, has some amplitude. Well, each one of those ports can also reflect a signal. And here's the amplitudes of all of the reflected waves. The matrix that relates these input amplitudes to output amplitudes is the scattering matrix. Now, very often we only have a two port network and it reduces to this. We'll have just two ports on either side. And so we can have an input from port one or we could have an input from port two coming backward. Now, some of this input can transmit through to output two. And the parameter that describes transmission through this network is S21. And it means we're injecting a signal in port one and it's coming out in port two. Well, some of that input wave could also reflect back to the output. That scattering parameter called S11 or reflectance we've been calling it means we're inputting our signal into port one and we're looking at port one. Well, we can have an input from the other side, and that input that travels all the way straight through, that's an S12. And we would expect S21 and S12 to look very similar, and in fact, they're usually equal for reciprocal networks, and most things are. Some of that input can reflect back at port 2, and that's our S22 parameter. And so S21 is commonly used for transmission, and it's, common, it's so commonly used that people will even stop using the word transmission or transmittance. They'll just say, hey, the S21 of this circuit is 10 dB or something like that. And the S11 is so commonly used for reflection, they'll, people will just say S11 instead of saying 10 dB of reflection. So those are scattering parameters, and I really wish I could go into more detail, but unfortunately, we have to leave it here.